I gotta listen to people because of your fucking shit. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Scholars, welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. Now, I'm a professional artist and a master educator who's attempting to provide you with the best in art historical content. If you like this video, others in the series, check them out. I'd love you to subscribe. Let's interact. Be yeah. <laughs> are you stupid? Are you, are you an idiot? What the f*** are you staring at me for? Now, as you know, because you clicked on the video, we're going to jump into a pretty big topic. The topic of Greek art. It's going to span decades. It's going to span uh, a lot of different types of content. But what I'm going to attempt to do is boil it down and give you the, the basics. Give you a sense of what it was all about. And then we can go forward and make more videos that are a little bit more specific to things that you might be interested in and uh, dive a little bit deeper. But again, I want to give you a bit of a overview of uh, the time, the history, the arts of the Greek time period. When speaking about Greek culture and the ancient Greeks, it's very important to consider the fact that there's a lot of different things going on simultaneously. Ancient Greek art is a reflection of its society, so we have to look a little bit at the society to understand the art. Education and athletics were an important part to the Greek society. Maybe one of the most known Greek traditions around the world is the Olympic Games. All wars were stopped for this festival to the god of the gods, Zeus. Before these games began, priests would sacrifice animals for Zeus, including the butchering of hundreds of ox for a public feast. Only free-born Greek men were allowed to take part in this five-day-long Olympic festival of games. Unmarried women and girls could sit in the stands, but that's about it. Men competed in the nude, which was a time-honored tradition of Hellenistic culture. Only a true caveman would be ashamed to display their body. But it also put all people, regardless of class, on the same level. There were 18 core events that began with the chariot race. One of the more famed chariot races was of 67 AD, where Emperor Nero won the first prize even though he fell off his chariot and actually never even completed the race. Other events included wrestling, running, javelin, boxing, and the discus. Why don't you put some clothes on these statues? Why? Well, they're disgraceful. They're not supposed to have clothes. That's the way the Greeks chiseled them. There was also the Hiplonodroma, which was a 400-yard run in full armor, and the Pancraton, which was an MMA-style brawl with no rules except you couldn't gouge their eyes. And of course, we're familiar with the Olympic Games enough to know that it's all athletic events. However, in the Greek days, with the ancient Greeks, it was not just about athletic events. This was a circus-like atmosphere that had all kinds of shows and programs including eating contests, beauty contests, the readings of Homer competitions, and judged art competitions. These games were held every four years from 776 BC until 394 AD when the Christian Emperor Theodosius banned all pagan festivals. Eventually, the games would resume in 1896 and are held to this day every four years. It's so lonely at the top of Olympus. <sighs> in general, Greek art was always evolving into new styles. They developed new and unique ways of visually communicating their ideas. 1000 to 600 BC is known as the Great Age of Pottery. Now this evolution began with some geometric shapes that were glazed onto ceramic wares. This style is regarded as the geometric style, again from about 1000 to 700 BC. Now as this evolved, 
Greeks organized their patterns into bands. This was an Egyptian influence. They also started using a new ceramic media called red terracotta clay with black glazes or slips. This would give the figures kind of a black look, thus developing the black figure style that was popular from 700 BC to 480 BC. Now overlapping with this style, the Greeks changed into a blackened clay with red slip style. This would give the figures more of a red look. So this is called the red figure style, popular from 530 BC to about 320 BC. It's also important to recognize that the Greeks created wares in a specific shape for a very specific purpose. There are five basic shapes that go with a specific purpose. First we have a crater. This is a large opening type vessel used to mix water and wine. This is a hydria. This is a vessel used for carrying water, typically with three handles, two to carry, one to pour. A kylix is a two-handled cup. An inako is a wine jug. And this is an amphora. It's a large vessel used mostly for the storage of food. <laughs> On the surface of these ceramic wares, they used a series of slips in order to depict and tell various stories. As is true today, every artist had their own style or way of telling that story. One of the first ceramicists really to develop a reputation for high quality storytelling and a unique style was Exekias. He was regarded as the master of the black figure style painting who worked from about 550 through 525 BC in Athens. His works were exported all over the Greek Empire. And of course, he was known for the highest of quality in his artworks. We can presume that over his career he would have produced hundreds, if not thousands of works over his career, but only 11 of those signed works are still known today. All works, regardless of the artist that created them, tell us the stories of the gods they believed in and also explain the world as they saw it. Consider, most people at this time are completely illiterate. Placing these stories into an illustration on everyday products like ceramics that they're using and carrying and looking at all of the time remind everyone the way of life that they are intended to live. I can't breathe. <laughs> you have to understand, dear, that love hurts. The ancient Greeks were really drawn as a culture toward many areas of life including mathematics, philosophy, and the study of the human form. I mean, I would even say that they were borderline obsessive with discovering the perfect human body. The better the person looked physically, the closer they were to the gods. Statue here to Venus de Milo, very famous sculpture that's had its arms missing for thousands of years, but nobody seems to mind, I know I don't. <laughs> We can eventually see them get to this in their sculpture, but it really didn't start out that way. Their sculptures really began with these abstracted bronze forms. And again, as I said before, they really evolved as they went along through time. Perhaps the best example of this is the Curios figure. From these abstracted forms, they began to work more in a stone media with a more realistic feel and a little bit larger scale. Perhaps the best example of this is the Kreatos boy. Kreatos boy stands without a leg balance and has space between his arms and sides. This work is said to have been created by the sculptor Kreatos. For the first time, humans were creating art as a perfect imitation of life. The way he is standing is also quite unique. He is standing with a natural posturing called contrapposto. Contrapposto is a very relaxed standing, as though you would see it in a natural form even to this day. But that may not be completely a good thing for artists. You see, humans are hardwired to get bored with very realistic looking things. Human brains are geared to like things that are a little bit abstracted and a little bit exaggerated. 
For this reason, the Greeks moved from these very realistic images to a more superhuman looking image that make these sculptures of humans even better looking than perfect. No longer was it cool just to be standing there as you know, people do, but they need to be doing something exaggerated, some sort of exaggerated action. The more complex the action, the more complex the art. And this hardwiring, this understanding of the hardwiring is still very important today. Consider modern fashion. Look at the digital alterations that we find in magazines and makeup, like contouring and things like that, and look at a lot of things around us. They're very exaggerated, and we like the things that are very exaggerated, not just plain and normal. Polyclitos was a sculptor during the 5th century BC that really focused on developing mathematic ratios to keep the human form looking somewhat correct. His most important discovery was the development of contrapposto. He used it then as we use it now to keep human form in proper proportion. After this is mastered, an artist has the ability to give the illusion that the human body is actually in motion. And we can see this in actual sculptures of the time, like the discus thrower. I don't like it any more than you, man. Now, when it comes to architecture, temples are the absolute most important buildings in Greek society. There are some basic principles and elements that go into basically any temple-like structure. First off, we have the column, which consists of two parts, the shaft and the capital. The capital is the top of the shaft, giving us order or gender of the building. The term capital comes from the Latin word caput, meaning head. Greek and Roman architecture uses two basic orders or genders, Doric and Ionic. Doric is male and probably most popular where Ionic is female. Side note, as these things would evolve, the Corinthian order was developed to establish a non-gender or as being omnigender. What can I say? I'm a very sexual being. <laughs> Resting at the top of the capital is an architrave and a frieze which is usually decorated. The roof is supported by the frieze. This triangular shelf created at the roof line and the frieze is called the pediment. A lot of times we'll see examples of sculptures being placed in these pediments that tell stories about the patron god of the temple or whatever. The Greeks were overly obsessed with numbers. Math was very much seen as a sacred gift from the gods. They discovered the importance of the Fibonacci numbers and the golden rectangle. This is used wherever there is harmony. The curvature of a bent finger, the keys on a piano, the creation of honeycomb, the baby in utero, and on and on. Basically, the golden rectangle is a 1 to 1.6 ratio that they really try to pack into a lot of the architectural and sculptural things that are created at this time. One of the most iconic structures of the time was definitely the Parthenon. The Parthenon was built in Athens at the top of the Acropolis. Acropolis meaning a hilltop fortress. Now, a lot of times I'll get students that confuse the Parthenon with the Acropolis. I don't really understand why, but for some reason that's a little confusing. But just remember that the Parthenon is the building and the Acropolis is the hill. There are lots of really interesting facts and features about the Parthenon, so let's get into a few of those. The chief builder of the project was Phidias, who was also responsible for creating the sculpture to Athena. We'll talk about that here in a moment, but... The designers of the project were Ictinos and Callicrotes. It was the idea of Periclides that after Athens held off Xerxes and the Persians, that the destroyed temples atop the Acropolis would be rebuilt. At the center of this work was the construction of the Parthenon. It was constructed with the illusion of visual perfection. The base was built at a bit of a curve. The elements were not interchangeable although they looked like they could be, but no, they weren't. And mathematically, the building keeps with a 9 to 4 ratio throughout the entire structure, but also incorporates the golden ratio of a 1 to 1.6. 
that is considered to be the mathematical formula to aesthetics or visual beauty. The Parthenon is a two-cella chamber design structure, meaning that it has two solid walls inside of the colonnade that is largely constructed out of marble. Now this particular marble was well known in ancient Greece for its high quality and beauty. But although beautiful, the marble would have been painted. That's right, the Greeks painted all of these things. Their sculptures and their structures would have been painted with really, really bright, vibrant colors. As far as the functionality of this building goes, the primary purpose of the building was a place of worship for the goddess Athena, obviously the namesake of the city of Athens. In the main room, there would have been a 40-foot tall statue of her. It was likely made out of ivory and gold that would have been cut into strips and placed over a wooden armature. The second chamber would have been used as a treasury for the Delinian League. A first in this building, which is obviously unique, is that the design has Doric Order columns with an Ionic frieze. Inside the structure, Ionic columns would have been used because Ionic is female and Athena is a female goddess and, you know, they match. The columns themselves were made to be stacked in smaller sections so that the blocks would fit perfectly together. The sections were made with a square notch placed perfectly in the center. In this notch, they would have placed a cedar wood block with a hole in the center. The top section would have been lowered with the wooden block that had a wooden peg coming down. After that peg was inserted into the hole, the blocks were perfectly on center and only minor adjustment was necessary. Another interesting note on those columns is that they tip in slightly and that gives them the appearance of being more stable and thus looking stronger as one would look up at them. Also in this optical adjustment thing, the columns also swell in the middle so that they don't appear to sag. In its prime, the Parthenon was used for civic meetings, place of worship, an art gallery, a bank, and a library. And since then, it's been attacked, problems due to damaging restoration techniques in the early 1900s, partially exploded, set on fire, its artwork has been looted, air pollution, it has survived earthquakes, served as a church, and Spartan military barracks. Since 1975, the Parthenon has been getting quite a facelift by the Acropolis Restoration Project. This painstaking project works to preserve all the original pieces of the structure. For example, it took five years to properly place and restore 500 pieces of marble section, keeping in mind that there are 70,000 in the whole structure. Bunch of losers gone loco. As time went by, the Greeks were weakened after the Peloponnesian War. Soon, Greece was controlled by a Macedonian prince by the name of Alexander the Great. You might have heard of him. He ended up conquering Macedonia, Greece, Egypt, much of the Middle East, Persia, and West India. After his death, the kingdom was divided in 147 BC. Greece would become a part of the Roman Empire. Now, although the Greek civilization is not what it once was, their ideas and discoveries have really changed the world forever. These classic things, these ideas rooted in Greek and Roman origin, are really interesting treasures for us to study and look at more deeply, not only in the study of art, but history, architecture, and much, much more. <laughs> now, that's a lot. But I do love that story. I appreciate you for letting me tell it to you and share it along. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day. And what the f*** are you doing on TV anyhow?